Hello, and welcome to AMAT 362, Probability for Statistics at UAlbany. This is lecture 16. Today, we're gonna do a quick recap of some of the things we've covered in the past eight lectures, um, including this one. Uh, in particular, we're gonna be focusing on um, some important distributions, some of which are continuous, but most of them are discrete. Uh, and we're gonna be looking at the two main summary statistics of each of these distributions. This is the mean and the standard deviation. Uh, at times we'll connect with concepts like uh, the mode and, but not really the, the median as much. Uh, I wanna really emphasize that so much of probability theory can be thought of as coming from one basic building block, random variable. And this building block is the Bernoulli distribution. which you can just think of as essentially an indicator random variable that indicates whether or not an event occurred. Specifically, this is the random variable that essentially has two outcomes. Um, one, indicating whether or not the event occurred and zero if the event did not occur. And so we say that it occurs with uh, x equals one if the event occurred. And we're gonna assume we know what that probability is ahead of time. It's gonna say it's p and then zero if it didn't occur. And we say that's with probability q, which is one minus p. Of course, we're familiar with lots of examples of this. Um, I'll write down just two quick ones. Um, imagine you, you flip a coin. Now the outcomes that are associated to flipping a coin is heads or tails. But suppose we wanna say, I wanna know, did the event a heads came up occurred? And if it did, I'm gonna record that by writing down one. So, in that case, we'll say x equals one if heads, and assuming that's a fair coin, uh, that means the probability of that occurring is a half and zero if tails. And in this case, q is also a half. Um, you could also roll a die. Um, and suppose we're interested in the event that a one comes up. Or it could be, let's say, a five, just to make sure that we're distinguishing the concept of the number and the value for this Bernoulli random variable. And, if uh, the face value uh, five is the thing that's facing up, and of course, we know that assuming this is a fair die, that has it's with a probability of sixth. And then it's going to be zero otherwise. Now, um, regardless of what um, this particular phenomenon is modeling, uh, we can say two things about the mean and the standard deviation. So the mean in this case is always going to be uh, P, which is the probability of a success. Uh, and the standard deviation is the square root of P times Q, which comes from the fact that the variance is actually P times Q. And remember, uh, the standard deviation is always the square root of the variance. So what's inside the square root is actually the variance. All right. We'll see how this is used, but I want to go ahead and show how this actually does occur as a building block. Um, the most frequent way in which Bernoulli's appear is when we try to do a, an experiment, such as flipping a coin or rolling a die a bunch of times, and we want to count what was the total number of times that that event occurred. So 
our next one is going to be uh, the binomial. But I'll go ahead and box these guys just so we know where they are. All right, so with the binomial, we can think of this um, Sn as a sum of n independent and identically distributed uh, Bernoullis. So this equals a sum of n iid Bernoullis. And basically what it does is it counts the number of times a, the, an event, let me say the event of interest occurs. The key formula for the binomial is that probability that the number of events that occur, or number of the important event that occurs, which we call success. Uh, let me go ahead and indicate that. So the event of interest, which we call success, is given by n choose k, p to the k, q to the n minus k. And so we think of this as the, uh, the PMF for uh, a binomial random variable. Um, we spent some time trying to develop this notion of linearity of expectation. And part of that was to get at what the mean uh, and then actually this, and then eventually the standard deviation of the binomial is. So let's just go ahead and recall what those were. Uh, so mean of a binomial is the same thing as the mean or the expectation of this sum of n Bernoullis. And so by using uh, linearity of expectation, we could conclude that this was the same thing as the expectation of the sum, which is going to be n times p. So this is going to be the important formula to remember when computing the mean of uh, a binomial distribution. Now, what about the standard deviation? Well, here we saw that variance um, is not actually linear, um, but it is if the variables involved are independent. So remember, variance of x plus y is equal to, so I'm going to say recall, if x and y are independent. Now, leveraging that, we can then conclude that the variance of the binomial, Sn, is the same thing as n times p times q, which implies that the standard deviation of a binomial is the square root of n p q. So those are already two really important um, building blocks. Um, again, just to give you an example, when do we use the binomial? You know, suppose I uh, flip a coin 10 times. What's the probability of uh, 
three heads. Well, remember I have to choose three of the 10 flips to be heads. And there are 10 choose three ways of doing that. And then I need to multiply by the probability of those three heads, which is a half raised to the third. And then I need the probability of the complement number of tails, which is one half to the seventh. So all told, this ends up being one half uh, to the 10th times this binomial coefficient, 10 choose three. Um, very common mistake is that people will say that uh, this is the answer, um, or maybe they'll add a half three times, um, but then that's already a number larger than one. Uh, so it's really important to make sure that you know when to apply the binomial uh, random variable. Of course, in this experiment, what happens, what should I expect to occur? So that amounts to what do I expect out of 10 flips? How many heads do I expect to get? Well, that's just 10 times a half, which is five. So three is not really the most likely outcome. And in this case, actually, the, the mode and the mean uh, agree. Um, and that occurs actually at there being five heads. Now, what about the standard deviation? Well, it's going to be 10 times a half times a half. Same thing as 10 fourths. So I can just write that as square root of 10 over 4. Now, when I'm looking at situations where I'm, say, flipping a coin 10 times, um, um, the numbers are still manageable. But let's imagine that instead I'm flipping a coin like 100 times. If you recall, what we ended up using there was this normal approximation to uh, the binomial, which we also call the baby central limit theorem. This just has to deal with the fact that um, when I'm looking at the sort of histogram of probabilities associated to uh, a binomial random variable, and I'm counting the number of successes, let's say, of flipping a coin 10 times and trying to count the number of heads, what you'll see is that I get a probability distribution that kind of looks uh, like this. Of course, symmetric around, in this case, the, the mean. And so we end up looking like uh, something that should remind you of this bell curve, which is, is the same thing as the sort of normal distribution, it's the bell curve. Now, what did this say? Uh, this said that if I want to compute, uh, so it says some, something like this. So as long as square root of, um, NPQ is, let's say, greater than three, then the probability of SN being between two values, A and B, is well approximated by the integral from a star b star of e to the minus z squared over 2 over square root of 2 pi uh, integrated uh, via dz. And this, in turn, is equal to uh, a function called capital phi evaluated at b minus n times p divided by the square root 
of MPQ minus V evaluated at A minus NP square root of MPQ. Um, and essentially this right here is what's inside this argument is B star and what's inside this argument here is A star. Um, and this guy right here is the unit normal distribution. And so this has mean zero and standard deviation one. Um, and once I convert my values into B star to A star, what I'm computing here is then the difference between, uh, let's say the green area, which is the area under the curve uh, left of A star and the orange area, which is the area under the curve uh, to the left of B star. This right here is then phi of A star. This is sometimes called the, the CDF or the cumulative distribution function of phi, our unit normal PDF. Now, of course, we also introduced, because this is an outcome, which is uh, integer valued, so meaning uh, you can count uh, how many successes occurred. It's obviously an integer. Sometimes it's useful to introduce uh, what's called a continuity correction, uh, which you could think of as more of a, a bonus, but you should uh, try to use it when you think it's appropriate. So this just says that when I wanna find the probability that SN lies uh, between A and B inclusive of A and B, the boundaries, then I can instead compute this by shifting up by a half on the right-hand side and then shifting down by a half on the, on the left-hand side. And again, we call this the continuity correction. The way that you end up actually evaluating these is, is by using our Z table. Maybe let's do a, let's do a quick example just to um, uh, make sure we understand this. All right, so let's do an example. So imagine I have, uh, let's just imagine I've done some investigation and, and some quality control. And I know that the, uh, the ramen noodle company uh, produces uh, defective noodle packets at a rate of let's say 5%, which essentially means that uh, one out of 20 of your, your uh, noodle packets are gonna have something wrong with them. Maybe they've got the spices in them, uh, maybe they didn't seal properly, et cetera. I'm, I'm making this up. So this is, please don't sue me ramen noodle company. Um, uh, but let's imagine that uh, I work at one of the local market 32s and we get in a big shipment of ramen noodle and there's a thousand uh, ramen noodle packets inside of one of these big crates. Um, so let's say I open a crate containing 1,000 uh, uh, ramen noodles. Noodle packets, sorry. And find 60 defective ones. Um, 
And let's say, what's the probability of of finding at least 60 defectives. Sometimes you might just phrase this as, uh, what's the probability of that event? Um, and, and again, the idea here is you want to think of uh, each ramen noodle packet as being a Bernoulli random variable where, you know, I've got my little, my packet, uh, ramen, and I'm investigating each one of these. Um, and there are a whole bunch. Again, I, there are a thousand here. Um, but, but I find, you know, all right, is, is, all right, this one's defective. Maybe this one's defective, but you know, this one's good, this one's good, this one's good, this one's good. Um, each of these, the x1 through, um, you know, x20, x600, uh, x1000, <clears throat> so the thousand three uh, ramen packet, if I indicate whether or not it's defective, um, by using each of these xi's as an indicator random variable with probability that x equals one, so is defective. The probability p uh, which is 5%, which is the same thing as one out of 20, and zero is, is fine. And that happens with probability Q, which is uh, 19 out of 20. Then first of all, I expect <clears throat> uh, this to be a thousand times <clears throat> uh, one out of 20, which is the same thing as saying n times P, <clears throat> uh, which works out to about 50. So 50 defective uh, ramen noodle packets is what I would expect. And here I'm saying a little more than usual. And just like my question I asked several lectures ago of like, why are we impressed by tall people? Um, again, the probability of a, of a single person being a very particular height uh, is not what we usually mean, but what's the probability of that? Instead, what we were asking for is the, the sort of tail probability. And the beautiful fact of this, um, normal approximation to the uh, uh, binomial says that what I'm asking here is, you know, I expect to see about 50 and I want to know what's this tail probability. It's the area to the, to the right of that value. So alternatively, I can use this um, normal approximation to say, all right, well, what's the probability of getting uh, 60 or more? So it's saying Sn is, is greater than or equal to 60. Well, I'm looking to the area to the right here. So I can take one minus uh, the CDF of this normal distribution, this phi, where I've subtracted by 60 minus uh, n times p divided by square root of mpq. Um, and again, if you, if you sort of follow along with, with the calculation here, it's the same thing as one minus uh, phi of, uh, well, 10 in the numerator. And then I'm dividing by uh, uh, the square root of, uh, 50 times, because that's n times p, and then I multiply that by q, which is 19 over 20. So if you, if you work this all out, um, and I can just plug it into my calculator right now. Uh, so, so 10 divided by sqrt of uh, 50 times 0.95, uh, 
works out to be about 1.45. Um, so this this right here and so this whole value right here. ends up working out to being about 1.45, uh, which just deals with the fact that um, uh, that square root expression ends up working out to about you know, 6.89. And then so 10 divided by 6.89 says, I'm looking for something that's 1.45 standard deviations above the mean. Notice I didn't use the continuity correction here. Um, so if we wanted a more precise answer, I could use that, but this will, this will be fine. So the process then, says, well, let's go look at our Z table. And now let's go look at the value associated to <clears throat> 1.45. If I look for the first few digits, 1.4 in the left-hand column, I find it you know, about 14 items down. And then I look down at this and I get, oh, 0.9265. So that means that the area to the left of this curve is uh, 0.9625. So this ends up equaling. So after doing our z table lookup, v of 1.45, I end up getting that this is equal to 1 minus 0.9625. Let me just double check that I did that right. Uh, 9265. So I, I transposed them. which works out to, um, you know, a little over 7%, right? 7.35%. Uh, so actually seeing that many defective ramen noodle packets is uh, actually a little unusual. Uh, and, and again, uh, this area to the left here is computed by computing phi of 1.45, because I'm looking at the uh, probability of seeing something that occurs less than 1.45 standard deviations above the mean of 50. All right. So let's kind of continue with our uh, with our, our story. Uh, so we just introduced uh, the Bernoulli, which is an indicator random variable, sum of Bernoulli's, which is a binomial. Uh, for large n or whatever that n times p times q is, you know, greater than nine roughly, we can use a normal approximation to some degree of accuracy. What makes this different, this normal approximation different from the grown-up uniform, grown-up uh, central limit theorem is the fact that the central limit theorem holds for the sum of any collection of random variables, not just Bernoulli's. So for example, I could look at the sum of uniform random variables, like we look at with a rolled, uh, rolling a die, the outcomes are between one and six. So let's just re remind ourselves briefly of what, what that looks like. So, so we also have our, our uniform random variable. And let's say it's distributed on the values a, a plus one, all the way up to b. So in this case, um, x uniform on A through uh, B, what that means is that the probability that X equals some value K is uh, one over B minus A uh, plus one uh, for K inside of this range. Uh, let me write it as this for k between a and b, uh, an integer. And it's 0 otherwise. Now, what's our mean? Well, pretty easy to see. It's the same thing as doing uh, taking the two endpoints and, and adding them, and then dividing by 2. It's just sort of the average uh, value that com comes out of this. Um, standard deviation, uh, a little more complicated, um, but uh, so E of X equals this, and then SD of X 
equals uh, square root of b minus a plus one squared minus one divided by 12. And this is something you can derive or take on faith um, or at least have it handy as a reference. Um, the typical example of a uniform distribution is uh, rolling a die and then letting x be the face value. Now for a six-sided die, uh, that means you know any of the values Uh, is equally likely with probability one over six for uh, k between one and six and then zero otherwise. And that the expected face value, which in this case is, is not uh, the same thing as the, the mode uh, or, or even the median, uh, ends up being well, if you use the formula, it's six plus one divided by two is seven halves, uh, which in this case equals 3.5. In fact, this is not a value you can actually observe when rolling a die. Um, so expected almost feels a little counterintuitive here, but that's because what the expectation is really uh, representing here is our, our sort of average of, if you take values, add them all up and then divide by the number of times you perform the experiment, experiment uh, then you would get at um, this value. So I'll just, I'll just remark, this is uh, uh, definitely not the mode uh, which equals the most probable Uh, and that's a, a big knot there. Uh, but instead, if you were to take uh, the empirical average, which says, well, let's take xn and then roll my die several times and divide by n, where each of these are uh, uh, die rolls. This is sometimes called x bar. Uh, Sn would would sort of uh, approach the uh, the true mean here, which in this case equals you know seven halves. And and the reason for this was uh, using the law of averages for large numbers. which we derived as a consequence of, of uh, Chebyshev inequality. Um, what else is there to say here? Um, well, again, we can compute the standard deviation of x, uh, which works out in this case to be square root of 35 over 12. No. So this would come up um, in our more grown-up application of uh, of the central limit theorem. Um, so let me just go ahead and say this is not as powerful as uh, the true central limit theorem, which essentially says that if x1 through xn are iid random variables with the expectation of each of these xi being the same. That's what it means to be identically distributed. And the standard deviation of all the xi equaling sigma. Uh, then what do we get? Uh, the probability that sn, the sum of these random variables, uh, this can be well approximated for large n by this phi of um, 
B minus N times mu. And then I just take square root of N times sigma squared, where that's the variance of each of these individual random variables, again, minus then the other value, A minus N mu divided by square root of N sigma squared. So notice this looks almost identical to the formula I wrote down for approximating the binomial when n is large, um, with the exception that I, I know what the expectation of a Bernoulli is. It's, uh, that means p, mu ends up equaling p. And then similarly, I know that sigma squared is p times q. Um, but again, this, this central limit theorem applies to any collection of random variables. Um, as long as you sum up their values, um, you can predict what the probability of the sum is by using uh, this formula, where each of these is the CDF of our unit normal. Um, and so this ends up being your z value. And then you look up in a z table to find this value. All right, so I'll leave you to maybe work through the, the following example uh, on your own. So here's a practice question. Uh, if I roll a die 100 times, uh, estimate the probability, and let's let S100 equals the sum of the face values. When you do that die 100 times, so let's estimate the probability that uh, that sum lies between uh, 320 and 380. And here I'm just using the fact that um, I know that the mean is, is going to be 7 halves. Um, and so if I multiply that by 100, well, a half goes into 150 times. And then so 7 times 50 is 350. So this actually looks like a symmetric interval around the mean. This didn't need to be symmetric. Um, it's just sort of convenient. Um, what you should end up seeing is you're computing what I called something like phi of uh, minus 1.76, positive 1.76. And of course, this value then equals uh, two times phi evaluated at 1.76 uh, minus one. Which again, if I were to just look up in the in the z table, 1.7 uh, is going to be about 17 items down. Six, I get 96 uh, percent. So this ends up being about 96 percent. Uh, so what's two times that? Well, it's going to be a total of eight less than 200. Um, so 192 um, minus one, 100% uh, then equals about 92%. Uh, so that's, I think, what you will find if you do that calculation uh, out. Of course, recall that a, a quick way of, of doing this is that 320 and 380 are going to be less than um, two standard deviations above and below the mean. Um, and so if, if here I have, which should remind you of something called the uh, 6895 and 99.7 rule, which says that this should correspond to plus or minus one sigma, two sigma, or three sigma In other words, that the area under the curve um, that is between plus or minus one sigma is 68% of the total area. So the probability of being within one standard deviation is 68%. Um, 1.76, which is the value I told you applies in this example, is less than, than, uh, than two. So what we're seeing here is something like, that's pretty close. So this is minus 1.76 sigma 
and this is about positive 1.76 sigma. And so I know this formula should be less than, but not far from 95%, because 95% is the amount of area above and below two standard deviations of the mean. Uh, and so 95 is less than 92, so this all works. All right, so sanity check, uh, if you want to do like a quick back of the envelope uh, calculation. Um, I want to emphasize something, which is that we so far have been taking some building block random variables and then looking at their sums. And when the sum is large, that value ends up being uh, normally distributed. So meaning when the number of, uh, of terms involved in the sum is large, then, then that looks normally distributed. Um, so what happens for, for small um, sums? So i.e. suppose I have uh, two random variables and I use it to define uh, a third random variable, z. Um, what, how do I compute, let's say, the probability that um, our sum is a, is a given value? Well, the, the, the big word, which we're going to use later, is convolution. Um, of PMFs or PDFs when we work with continuous random variables. And this has a more elegant interpretation uh, when our, our variables are, are continuously distributed. But it's it's worth, worth going ahead and just uh, figuring out, well, if I have some uh, joint density function uh, or joint probability mass function, of x, y, which is telling you the probability of x and y occurring, then one way to compute the probability that z equals some fixed value k is to sum over all pairs of values i and j such that i plus j equals k and computing uh, probability that x equals i and y equals j. And so I just have to sum up all, over all of these. You know. um, and there might be some nicer formulations uh, in, in general, but, but one thing to note, so I'm just going to do that the sum of, let's say, uniforms is not uniformly distributed. And as like a, a quick example of that is if you roll two dice, so just instead of rolling, or maybe you roll a dice twice, two times, and you try to compute what's the probability that S2, let's say, equals 5. And so we let S2 equal x1 plus x2, value on the first roll plus the value of the second roll. Well, this ends up equaling um, something like, all right, well, it's the probability that the first one, let's say, was a, a 4, and the second one was a 1, plus the probability that the first one was a 3, and the second one was a 2 plus the probability that the uh, third one, the first roll was a three, and the second one was, whoops, sorry, I wrote that down already. First one was a two, and the second roll was a three, plus the probability that the second first roll was a one, and the second roll was a four. Now, the probability of, of each of these events um, ends up being one out of 36. So we end up getting that this is uh, four out of 36. 
But if I instead ask, what's the probability that the sum is two? Well, there's only one way of doing that. I would have had to roll one uh, twice. And the probability of rolling one twice is one out of 36. And so what we end up seeing here is that uh, we get this kind of staircase. which is not going to be actually, which is of course not uniform. Uniform means everything uh, that can be possible has equally likely value or equally likely probability. So I'm going to try to comment on maybe when the summation property is preserved. Um, and so here, here's one uh, observation, which is that the, the sum of normals uh, is normal or, or stated more more explicitly if if I have one random variable like you know uh, I don't know height and that has some mean mu1 and some variance mu1 squared or sigma one squared, and I consider another uh, normally distributed quantity. Let's say, I don't know, someone's IQ, for example, if you believe in that kind of thing. Um, then assuming these are independent, then x1 plus x2 ends up being normally distributed with mean mu1 plus mu2. Uh, and with variance, um, the sum of these variances. This is normal with uh, expectation of x1 plus x2, of course, equaling sum of the means by linearity of expectation, but then also the variance of x1 plus x2, because they're independent, ends up being the sum of the variances. Um, so in particular, the standard deviation ends up being um, sort of governed by the Pythagorean theorem, square root of sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared. And this kind of makes sense, because if you sum enough things together and you get a normal, and then you were to then keep summing you should somehow preserve this property of being normal. This same phenomenon is true of a, of a random variable that we just introduced last lecture, uh, which was namely the Poisson random variable, uh, which if you remember is our, is our fish random variable. Uh, this is another approximation of the binomial random variable with n tries and p, where uh, p is small. And I, I usually mean like very small. And usually p is actually in some sense a function of n. Um, and we look at sort of the limit of this uh, ratio of these two things, um, we assume it approaches some pr probability parameter lambda. Um, so we say x is Poisson if the probability that x equals k is equal to lambda to the k over k factorial e to the minus lambda or k greater than or equal to zero, uh, again, an integer, and zero otherwise. So let me just go ahead and tell you um, some, some nice facts about, uh, about the Poisson, uh, namely that it has a, a standard deviation or mean, um, uh, we're down over there somewhere else. So here we have that the x, the mean 
the expectation of a Poisson with parameter lambda is actually just equal to lambda, which kind of makes sense because this is supposed to approximate a binomial whose expectation is n times p, um, and n times p is what approximates lambda, or I should say lambda is what approximates n times p. Uh, now, what about the standard deviation? Well, if we do the standard deviation of a Poisson, uh, it ends up equaling uh, the square root of lambda, which again kind of makes sense because uh, you know if this is supposed to approximate the expectation of a binomial, which is n times p, uh, and the standard deviation of a binomial uh, is equal to the square root of n times p times q, then you know n times p goes to lambda and q goes to one because I think a p is being going to zero. Um, then then this all all coheres. So um, maybe let's look at a quick example of of Poisson uh, used in action. And this was something that was alluded to already in uh, our worksheet from last lecture. So let's imagine that I am uh, baking cookies Fifty cookies with, uh, let's say, four hundred chocolate chips, and and somehow what you want to do is imagine that you've got this tray of cookies, um, and I'm just uh, I'm going to be. Uh, pitching some sort of uh, uh, chocolate chips uh, into into this this batter, but you can think of these chocolate chips as sort of being analogs of these uh, Nazi bombs being dropped over uh, London, where the probability of a particular cookie, uh, let's call this cookie Adam, being hit by a chocolate chip um, is is one out of 50 because you know, there are 50 other targets um, and me as a cookie, the probability that I will get hit by a particular chocolate chip is 50. But now I, I keep pelting uh, with chocolate chips uniformly at random amongst these. And, um, and then I end up getting uh, essentially a binomial random variable that counts the number of chocolate chips that I hit or I am hit with. Um, so the typical question you might ask is, uh, what's the probability that a distinguished cookie, uh, let's call them, um, you know, this is Adam, probability that A uh, gets no chocolate chips. Well, I just need to figure out lambda, which is n times p, which ends up equaling 8. So this ends up being approximated by e to the minus 8. It's very, very small number. It's, it's basically 0. 0.00003 or something like that. Yeah. Um, but let's, let's consider uh, an analogous question. Um, what's the probability that uh, uh, my particular cookie A gets um, more than 15 chocolate chips. So there are two things we can do. Um, um, well, first of all, let me say there are actually three things to do. So there's three possible answers. Uh, if you're if you're using the Poisson approximation, um, you could just use that as sort of the right answer, and then try to compute this exact way. So the exact answer would be, I'm going to sum over the probability that x equals k from k equals 16 to uh, to infinity. 
but really we know that infinity stops at like 400, but still 400 is a lot of chocolate chips. And um, it's unlikely that somehow all of those chocolate chips will get, get concentrated on that <clears throat> single cookie. Um, specifically, this would mean summing uh, from k equals 16 to infinity of uh, lambda to the k over k factorial e to the minus lambda. Uh, again, where lambda equals eight. That's, a, that's an unwieldy um, formula. Uh, and so this is why it's useful to maybe consider some of the uh, bounds or inequalities uh, that we introduced earlier. <clears throat> so one inequality we introduced was Markov's inequality. Which said something like uh, the probability that, uh, so for a non-negative random variable for random variable that's always greater than or equal to zero. Probability that X is greater than or equal to some value A is bounded from above by the expectation of X divided by A. So this is, this is Markov's inequality. So if I apply that in this case here, the probability of getting more than uh, 15 or 16 or greater uh, chocolate chips ends up equaling the expected number of chocolate chips, which is eight, divided by 16, which is a half. So we know there's less than a half chance that um, our particular cookie, Adam, is going to get uh, 16 or more chocolate chips. But we can also do better since we have standard deviation information. Uh, and this uses Chebyshev's inequality. This was uh, Markov's. Um, so, and this one applies for, for more general. So for any random variable x, uh, the probability that x exceeds its mean by more than some quantity c is bounded from above by the variance divided by c squared. Uh, and so this is, this is Chebyshev's. So let's see what Chebyshev would say in this example. Um, first of all, it's important to understand what exactly is meant by uh, absolute value of x minus mu being greater than some c. Uh, so to say that x minus mu is greater than c is to ask also for the probability of, of two events. First, x is less than mu minus c plus the probability that x is greater than mu plus c. So this is a, these are completely equivalent ways of, of thinking about this quantity that appears on the left-hand side of Chebyshev's. Uh, this is essentially estimating what I called a, a two-tail probability. So if I've got some distribution and I got its mean, I want to estimate what's in here, but I don't know that it looks like a normal or anything. Otherwise, I'll use the formulas for normal. No. Uh, but I can estimate what's in this tail just by using uh, the mean and the standard deviation. So in, in particular, if you apply this uh, to our example, uh, then, and I'm going to just choose, well, I know that mu equals eight. Um, and I can see just by looking at this the second term here, well, I want x to be greater than or equal to 16. Um, so 16 is the same thing as 8, which is mu, plus another 8. Um, so I should check c equals 8. And so what I end up getting here is like, what's the probability that x is less than or equal to 0? 
plus the probability that x is greater than or equal to 16. Now this, we can already estimate it, is e to the minus 8. Uh, but this is exactly what we want, what we want. And Chebyshev's uh, inequality says that I just need to take uh, sigma squared, which is the variance, and divide by, um, by c squared. Um, but the variance ends up being lambda, which is the same thing as 8. And I'm dividing by now 8 squared. So this is the same thing as it's less than an, an eighth probability, which is uh, less than a 12.5% chance. So notice that 12.5% is a much better bound than uh, this, which is 50%. So if you know what the standard deviation is and you're looking for a tail probability, and maybe sometimes we just estimate an upper tail um, by bounding the whole two tails, uh, you, can, you should use Chebyshev instead. All right, so there's uh, two more things I want to, um, uh, two more distributions I want to introduce. Uh, uh, but I want to just end this remark with, uh, since Poisson is a limiting distribution, Uh, I can say that a, the sum of Poissons is actually itself Poisson. And it's additive in the, in the respective parameter. So if, if x1 is Poisson with lambda 1, and x2 is Poisson with lambda 2, then this implies that if they're independent, that x1 plus x2 is Poisson and lambda 1 plus lambda 2. All right, we're not going to be using that um, uh, just yet, so don't worry about this too much. But there are two final distributions that are very important when thinking about problems and discrete probability. Uh, and these are, are the geometric and uh, negative binomial. which you can tell just by the titles related to binomial, um, but it actually provides as sort of a bridge between the geometric and the binomial, which is what we've been talking about essentially all through this lecture and most of this course. Again, if there's one thing you remember coming from this course, I hope it's the binomial distribution. So, uh, so for the geometric, which you already introduced, uh, uh, we introduced this parameter or this random variable t, which was the uh, uh, tri number of first success. And if you remember the probability, and here we're, we're assuming again that we're looking at a sequence of uh, IID Bernoulli's. Uh, so the probability that t equals k was that you had to fail k minus one times and then succeed on the kth try. Um, it was a zero otherwise. Now kind of continuing our classification here, uh, the expectation of t, although somewhat tedious to per, uh, uh, prove is is one over p, which makes total sense. Like if I'm if I succeed one out of ten times, then I expect to succeed once out of ten tries. Um, notice that ten is the same thing as one divided by one over ten. 
Um, similarly, the, the standard deviation of t uh, ends up looking like the square root of q divided by p, um, which you'll remember is the square root of the variance. Uh, so the variance is actually the same thing as q over p squared. Um, just to give you an idea, you know, if I, if I can land uh, one out of five kickflips on average, then uh, first of all, uh, the expected number of kickflips until I land is one out of one over five, which ends up being five. But what's the standard deviation in that number? Well, it's, it's the same thing as the square root of, uh, let me go with p squared, well, one over p squared is 25 times four fifths, which ends up equaling uh, so the square root of 20. Uh, which, if you if you work it out, is um, around around four or so. Uh, it's a little more than four because obviously it's greater than sixteen. Uh, um, so in particular, you can expect to have quite a bit of variance. Um, one counterintuitive thing is that the probability of landing your kickflip always goes down, uh, and so in particular for us, the mode of a geometric is occurs at k equals one. Um, and that just comes from looking at this formula. You know, if I'm multiplying by more numbers that are less than one, q is always going to be less than one, then that's just going to keep scaling down my probability. Um, this also illustrates why the mean is different because the, um, the expected number of tries required Is the balance point of this distribution, oh, which is one over p, and so those are those are sort of two things there, and you can try to combine it with any of the uh, methods we just introduced. Oh. Let me give you this one bridge um, uh, random variable. Uh, this is the the negative binomial. So what, what the negative binomial uh, is, is it counts the number of tries till the rth success. So t sub r is now going to be the number of tries to the rth success. So t sub r counts the number of tries to the rth success. So let's just figure out what this is. And in particular, let's try to figure out an exact formula for the probability that t sub r equals k. Oh, notice that when r equals 1, uh, this is the geometric. Um, but if, if r is larger than 1, then, then we have to kind of break this computation into two parts. First, we just assume that we succeed on the kth try, that our rth success is on the k try. That means we had r minus one successes prior to k. But those can be distributed in any way that we like. I just need that the total number, the total count of successes uh, is k minus one amongst my r minus one tries. So I have this binomial factor, um, which again was predicted by the title, that looks something like this. Um, and again, this Q ends up being raised to the, uh, well, let's just figure it out. It's R minus one minus K minus one. Um, the ones are gonna cancel. And then this gives us R minus K is the, uh, 
uh, factor for Q. So, so that's the probability of K minus one successes. Oh, I'm sorry, I flipped these guys. So this should be K minus one. Um, and this should be uh, R minus one. All right, so this actually should be then K minus R. Um, so this is the probability of R minus one successes in K minus one tries. And then I need to multiply this by the probability that the rth or the kth try is a success. And of course, that's just p because each of these tries is independent of the one that happened before. Um, so we end up then collecting all of these into uh, something where now p is raised to the usual k power, um, but then q is raised to k minus r. Um, just to give you some facts, um, the probability of, or the expectation of the negative binomial is r divided by p. And the standard deviation of uh, the negative binomial uh, is square root of RQ divided by P. Um, the type of example question that you might uh, have to face with this is uh, something that's related to, let's say, uh, cricket, uh, which is a game in darts. Uh, So what happens um, in darts is that you know you have to go around the board, and you actually have to hit uh, certain numbers, name of the ones between fifteen and twenty, uh, three times each, in order to close that number so that your opponent can't score any more points on you. Um, and so and so twenty is right here at the top. Suppose I can hit. with probability, uh, I don't know, a fourth. What's the probability that my third 20 occurs on k equals 6, so my sixth dart? Well, if you were to just apply the formula, you would need to take uh, five, choose two of those throws to be a success, times the probability of those uh, uh, two successes. So that's one fourth squared. And then three fourths probability of missing 20 has to occur three times. And then I need to multiply this by a fourth, which again is the probability of, of, of my sixth uh, throw being the uh, successful one. Yeah. And then this is just the probability of two successes and three throws. All right, so this lecture has already gone on way too long, but um, this gives you a fairly comprehensive uh, coverage of the things we've been talking about in the past eight lectures um, and should prepare you for your midterms. I look forward to seeing you all in class soon.